welcome back to another episode of Excuse My Grandma. It's Kim and my co-hosts. Grandma Gail. All right, everyone. We are joined by Rabbi Matthew Gewertz. He's the senior rabbi of Congregation B'nai Jereshren in Short Hills, New Jersey for 16 years, I believe. And it's the largest synagogue in New Jersey. He's also the author of To Build a Brave Space. Rabbi, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So well, I read the book and I love it. So I'm going to show, I'll show the picture of the book and then Kimmy will um, eventually put it on uh, her social media. But uh, the book is really, really wonderful, Rabbi. I, but what was very interesting is leading up to the book and how you got to the space where you are now in your at your synagogue and the emphasis of what you're doing now, which is getting people together with a dialogue. Uh, can we go back a little bit and start out? Yeah, like how and why did you become a rabbi? Right. Well, become a rabbi, you, you, <laughs> you would like the story. So uh, when I was 23, 24, I was in the corporate world, meaning I didn't go to rabbinic school. I, I went into the corporate world. I was an operations manager. My mother said to me, can you come over a uh, young Kipper afternoon? I want to talk to you. And uh, it's just funny for a rabbi to say that I was very happy to get a break from synagogue. So I went to see my mother and she said, you know, son, I believe that kids know more about themselves than adults give them credit for. I said, I believe that. And she said, because of that, she was a teacher. I always ask kids at a very young age what they want to be when they grow up, because I think they know something about themselves. And I said, I agree with that also. And she said, let me tell you what you declared at five years old. And she said, when you were five, you said, I want to be a rabbi on a motorcycle. Oh. And, and I said, Mom, are you suggesting I become a rabbi? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> she said, what's the matter? And I said, I'm not kosher. I can't keep down a relationship for more than three dates at a time. I go out drinking with my friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And she said, OK, but you're going to grow up. And you are also the confidant of all your friends. People come to you for counsel. You've always believed in God. You're a great storyteller. So basically, I said, to be respectful. I'll think about it. Thank you very much. Happy and healthy New Year. And I went home that night and laughing, told my best friend and roommate what she had said. And he didn't laugh in return. He said, we've all been waiting for this. Wow. And I said, what do you, but it took me three years from that point to actually go to school because I just didn't believe that's what I should be. But she was right. It was mm -hmm. a great gift she gave me. That's so interesting. So two questions. One, why rabbi then, I guess it adds in the religious aspect, but in, and not therapist or something like that. Um, and then also, did you end up living both dreams and getting the motorcycle too? <laughs> so the, the, uh, the great question, uh, you know, it's funny because it was really gut that made me go. And I had a professor from college who wrote me a recommendation and said, you better make sure that you really love Torah and that mm -hmm. you really have a relationship with God. Otherwise, this is not going to work. The God part I knew because for some reason, it's not like I'm, you know, walking around crying to God or beating a Bible on my chest, but I started talking to God at three years old four years old, as long back as I could remember. And that was my confidant. So, so before I'd go to sleep, I talked to God at night. And the Torah part, I had to make sure that three years of rabbinic school passed to really make sure that I loved it in the way that I did. And um, there was a theology class that I took that once I finished that and realized I could talk about all of it from an intellectually uh, mature position, meaning not just the kids, then I knew it was what I wanted to do. The motorcycle I never got on because about two years after that, my mother, who was a teacher, had a 17-year-old student who was killed in a motorcycle accident. And she came home, and my mother was a very emphatic woman, God bless her. And she said, you will never, ever, ever get on a motorcycle in your life. And I never did. So, so far, really she's led me. you on the right path. <laughs> she has. She has. Although, although because of this book, everyone asks about the motorcycle. And I do have a couple of replicas, but I've never gotten on one. Well, Kimmy's been on one. But it's no, I've scary. been on enough for both of us. So don't yeah, worry. I'm exactly. sure it makes, it makes your grandmother very nervous. Yeah. yeah. Very nervous. What was your relationship with your grandmother growing up? My grandmother. That's a, such a great question. I, I had uh, really, I'd say three grandmothers because I had my two grandmothers, but I also had a great grandmother that lived until I was 21. And she, I was incredibly close to. Uh, she, uh, my great grandfather also lived to 93. Oh. So uh, I had them yeah, for 20 years and she taught me the ethics and values of life. Uh, sometimes not always in the easiest way. By the way, it's right down there, they were in Palm Beach and uh, things like this is it's silly, but it's a, you know, a different generation. 
we'd play Pokino and I'd win a bunch of pennies. I just got, you know, I just euphoric. <laughs> she could tell gambling was in the system and she smacked my hand and she said, don't ever be too excited about winning money. And so that was like, but she also just, she told me stories about the old country and about the kind of human being I should be and, and what it means to be respectful of the world and to the world and how to be forgiving and how to be compassionate. So it was a, I, you know, 21 when she died, I was lucky to have her that long, but I was really heartbroken when she went. And my other grandmother, my dad's side died when I was seven, very painful uh, because I loved her very, and they didn't let me go to the funeral. In those days, they felt like it was- You were too young. Still, yeah, and, but yet I've always been sort of searching for her because I never had the closure. Uh, but I got to name my youngest, uh, her first name is Sadie, but the second name is Rose. And my wife and I call her Rose mostly, more than we call her Sadie. Wow. And it's because I like to have my grandmother in my heart. So I call her Rosie all the time. So really I would say that the women were more powerful in my family in terms of influence on me than the men were actually. Interesting. Right. What about your wife? You mentioned your daughter, you have three kids, right? Um, How did you meet and what did she have the same um, or was she equally religious to you? Uh, differently. So in fact, so we, we met, she was a consultant, a fundraising consultant for the rabbinic seminary that I went to the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. I was already out of school, but we were back to interview potential candidates for a rabbinic position. And I guess there were a bunch of people on both sides, both from the college and from the synagogue I served, who were conspiring to bring us together. But thank God I didn't know because I never would have been a part of it. And when I was introduced to her, I was in such work mode that I gave her a business card and said, hey, we have a great young professionals group. And I went upstairs to lunch with my senior rabbi and the president of my congregation. My senior rabbi is not eating. And I'm like, Robert, what's wrong with you? It's, it's time to eat. And he said, are you some kind of idiot? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? He said, I don't think that woman was being introduced to you for the young professionals group. <laughs> I said, oh. So I immediately went back downstairs and reintroduced myself and asked her to go out for a drink. And, and it, it very quickly took, I, I got married late. I, I didn't get married until I was 36. My parents got divorced. And as I write in the book, uh, in a generic way, I would say I was sort of scared of intimacy. Right. And um, so Lauren had a lot of patience with me and uh, a very good friend of mine who was a therapist said, you could do this two ways. You could wait till you're 50 and get over intimacy issues or marry the right person and you'll get over it together. So I chose mm -hmm. the latter. Yeah. And you tell a beautiful story in the um, in the book about Laura and before you were married uh, because she was downtown at 9-11. And, yeah, she you know, that was an amazing thing. And, and so many, I mean, I remember where I was in 9-11. We all ran up to school and got, Kimberly was just entering a, a kindergarten and we were all in the city and we just, nobody could believe what was happening. We, we really thought it was an accident at, at 10 of nine and nine o'clock we knew we were attacked. But you give the audience just a little snippet of, of uh, how, where Laura was and, and, you know, what you were doing that day. Yeah, I, I was on the treadmill um, running my three miles a day and was thinking through my Rosh Hashanah sermon, which was bound to be a disaster. I just wasn't getting any place with it. And then saw and exactly thought we all, we all thought. I thought it was a twin engine plane. My dad had told me about the Empire State Building uh, being hit when he was a kid. And I thought it was the same thing. And I got upstairs, realized the same thing as you did. And I, the phone rang. She said, honey, something's really wrong down here. There's papers flying all over the place. She didn't know what had happened yet. Yeah. I told her what had happened. And then the second plane flew right over her head as she was talking to me. Oh and she said, oh, she yelled. Right. And, uh, and that's the last I heard from her until later on in the afternoon. She uh, went to, I said to her, please just turn around and walk upstairs. Her boss begged her to come upstairs. And she describes putting wet towels on the window because when the towers fell, it became so hot that they thought that the heat would burst through the building. Wow. And so she, in retrospect, was fine, but I think she thought for a couple of those hours that she might not make it out of there. And yeah. uh, so it was really scary. Again, I realized that I didn't finish what I said before. Lauren found religion a little bit later. She had an adult bat mitzvah. And the hardest part about us coming together was that everyone assumed that her connection to Judaism was her husband. Mm -hmm. And that was really offensive to her because her connection was what she found spiritually. And once we figured that part out, everything was fine, but that was really hard at first. That's so interesting. Cause I feel like it's similar. Even people can relate in that. Like I went to a college 
um, that's a great college that I would have chosen anyway. And a lot of people say to me, like, you chose that because your ex-boyfriend went there. It's like, no, like I had my own connection to that place. It's a little different, but I'm thinking like, you want to, but sometimes people kind of want to like do their own, make sure it's their own. That it's correct. Their own. It's, and, and by the way, I think women especially get really easily appropriated, and it's it's about their connection to work, their relationship. Mm -hmm. And Lauren is a really strong human being, and woman, you know her sister decently well. Erica is also a very thank strong you. human being, and you know, thank God. I mean, that, that's already twenty three, twenty four years ago. I think it keeps on getting better, but we have a long way to go. <laughs> I wanted to get your advice for people listening um, of what to do when your significant other has either a different religious background or the same, but kind of a varying level of religious beliefs. Um, what, how do you approach that? And do you find that that becomes a problem? Yeah, I think that's a, thank you. That's a great question. There's two schools of thought um, specifically for interfaith, but I like the way you put it. It doesn't have to just be interfaith. It could be right. varying uh, connections to uh, religiosity and observance. So one school of thought is that love conquers all and it will, because your love is so powerful, you'll be able to work it out throughout the years and let it just come as it does. The other one is try to talk about every single issue on the table because uh, it's not as important to work out the issues on the table, but to try to uh, gauge what kind of reactions you have to those and how your partner reacts to those. I believe in the latter. I don't believe that love, love conquers all. I think that many people who love each other uh, end up in broken marriages because of circumstances. Yeah, Miguel likes that one. <laughs> yeah, because I because I know it for a fact from my friends. You know, you have to know where people are in in certain philosophies. You don't have to be exactly a clone of each other, but you have to understand each other and be respectful of each other's differences. If you're not, and you want to remake them in your image it doesn't work. And, mm -hmm. and and love does not conquer all. Love is fine for the first year or two, and then you have to have a solid foundation. So how do you approach those conversations then, Rabbi? Because let's say it's like you think, oh, we're both Jewish, but then you never yeah, talked about- have friends with this problem, with yeah. these issues. Yeah. Some people so want to observe I, I, Shabbat. Some don't. Some people want to raise their kids in a Jewish school. Some don't. Things like that. Yeah. So what I do is I say to them, uh, I- tell them what I just told you, the two different philosophies and say to them, I'm not here to judge because I because I don't win anything by someone being more Jewish than the other or becoming Jewish at all. I don't get a notch in my belt for that, but I do care about your children, your future children. So I say to them, here's the approach. And if you wanna go there with me, we'll go there without judgment, but so that you could hear each other and I'll go through. So the Christian Jewish is easier you go through Christmas uh, verses or and Hanukkah. You talk about baptism versus mm -hmm. and bris and baby naming. And sometimes people are like, what? You want to baptize? Or what? You want to circumcise my child with that archaic ritual? You know, And when that happens, mm -hmm. that gives them the possibility of working these things out before the marriage comes and the fighting happens. And if they can't get through it, by the way, sometimes they don't get married, which is a real, I mean, it's a heartbreak. For the for that moment, but really lucky later on yeah. because of both. And remember, this is you know pre SATs, pre flu, pre someone losing their job, pre you know whatever it is that happens. Like we go all go through crisis in life, and if you had that have this plus that, you're really putting yourself in a fraught position. So that's what I do. I I I, I try to get them and me to be as vulnerable and as open as possible to have the most uh, free flow of communication. And by the way. Only one or two haven't worked out. Almost all of them work it out because if they really do love each other, the love does work. But while they're still at a position where they don't have the rest of the world converging in on them. I'm, I'm curious if people in your congregation come to you, if they do decide, if from interfaith um, couples, if they do decide to raise their kids with both celebrating both holidays or doing both of the traditions, if you find that to be successful or if those couples are kind of like my kids are confused because that's kind of a stereotype I feel like I hear a lot. Yep. So I used to um, say to them, you could be Jewish and not Jewish, but you have to pick a religion for the kids. And now I don't do that to people because I feel like it's just too early. I, I still prefer it, but I do find this is what I say to couples that if you're just celebrating the two holidays as cultural holidays, it's probably fine. Um, but if you really get into the heart of Jesus as Savior, who's already risen and will rise again, versus us not believing that, and kids really ask the jugular questions, you better have an answer. 
because, or if parents, you know, we all have different connections with our kids. If the boy is closer to the dad who's Jewish and the girl closer to her mom who's not, do they get to choose based on their closeness to parent? Do they get to choose based on which uh, ritual gives them more presence? I mean, they're just kids. So mm -hmm. of course, like my kids, of course, want a Christmas, right? Every American wants Christmas. Yeah. And then as they now become identified Jews, they realize why they don't celebrate Christmas. But at five, they don't get that. Right. And so it's so parents can't let kids decide, which some people say they do, because they're just kids. And that means I don't feel like we're spiritually parenting them in ways that is going to be most successful. And some of them can't end up confused. And by the way, when they get that confused, they just reject all religion. Well, and I'll tell I you what my mother did. Now I'm I'm 80 years old, so I'm going to go back a lot, almost uh, 70, uh, maybe 73 years. I think I was five or six, and I really didn't know. I didn't understand why we couldn't celebrate Christmas. <laughs> so I took an old sock and I hung it on. We had fireplaces in those days. I lived in the in the suburbs, and I put it up for uh, up on the fireplace. And I expected the next morning to get up and have presents in the stocking. And I got up all excited. I was an only child at that point. I didn't, my brothers came later. <laughs> I went downstairs and I looked in the sock, in the stocking and there were potatoes. And I, <laughs> I started to cry. And I went up to my mother who only she could say this. I said, mom, what happened to the present? She says, you're Jewish. You don't get presents on Christmas. <laughs> she, so that was so I, brutal was, though. Like, that was I, the end of that. But you know what? That was the end of my ever right. putting a stocking up again. Right. I don't think anybody does that today. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's worried that they'll offend the child. <laughs> but also, like, but it I, worked. Yeah, that, that definitely worked. My mother, I remember being in Bloomingdale's and I wanted to sit on Santa's lap. <laughs> and she and she said and she's okay so i sat in his lap and his breath smelled and, and the beard was gross and i was like okay i'm done with that you know that's so it's, funny. Sometimes it's, it's like a kid you know you say i want to smoke a cigarette you give a kid a cigarette they'll never smoke again once they taste yeah, it yeah that's so funny see like i don't remember ever really wanting to celebrate christmas but i do remember actually being in palm beach at your old house and like in the morning you show cookies and you'd be like look a like reindeer had a bite of this cookie well, I think I think you were very, very little. I have that memory. I, I think you were very then little. I didn't we care. didn't have a tree. No, I might have just had a cookie. I, I think I, there was just. Cookies. I think I wanted you to celebrate everything, as I still do. But you definitely know you're Jewish, so yeah. it's it's not it's uh you know that that lesson went out the window with the cookies. Right. I had a bite of the cookie and I was like, oh, it's too cold. And then you're like, you're a right. Jew. <laughs> um. So, oh, also on the interfaith, um. Point. I thought it was interesting that you were the first rabbi of your congregation to um, perform those marriages. What was the, um, I guess, response from everyone at your synagogue? Was it positive? Yeah, I mean, I did it through a very, you know, sort of a process and also a sermon that I really worked hard on making it really thorough. And so no one knew till the end of the sermon what I was going to do. And because I, I think I laid out all the different reasons that one would do this or not do this, um, one family quit the congregation, uh, one family lowered their donation to a significant extent, and the rest of them gave a standing ovation. Right. So um, meaning that they were relieved that A, someone thought it out carefully, and B, that you know I was trying to sort of track along with the world, not just say anything goes. I don't think anything should go. But there are ways of bringing in boundaries even to an interfaith relationship. And no one ever thought that, but it was 11 years into my rabbinate. I hadn't done them for the first 11 years. I've only done it since then. Well, I have to say, honestly, I think we have to be a religion of inclusivity. I, I, I like that idea. I mean, you know, I don't want to turn anyone away because they're intermarried. As long as they decide prior to getting married how they're going to raise their child, and hopefully they raise them Jewish, but whatever. But I really think we should welcome everybody in. We're not, our numbers dwindled, and we want to build being you know the jewish population and by excluding people strictly on a religious basis because they married you know they weren't born jewish but if they wish to adapt to their to it or not even as long as they will agree to some jewish education for their children i i, I agree i think you should do it uh, every time um i think I, we should get to the most important part of this book which i really really for the first time, really, I'm going to show this to a couple I'm going out with for dinner tomorrow night that I always have an argument with. I think with I think after 2010, 
if I'm not incorrect in that. Uh, the politics in America got very divisive. And um, what bothers me is I was a political science major in at school, and I remember listening to both sides of issues. And we used to talk about it. And, you know, it was certainly even at the dinner table at a family conversation, we talked about different issues. Nobody had a fight. Nobody had to tell somebody to be quiet. You listened. And then you went about, you ate your pot roaster, you ate your, your chicken, and, and you didn't have a revolution. You didn't get up from the table in a huff. I think certainly... After 2016, with uh, President Trump's election, and then consequently in 2020, it's been terrible. And I, I'm so proud of you as a rabbi that have done what you're doing. And I love the idea of what do you call it? Um, the radical center. The radical center. And I want you to discuss this because I think this really in today's world could be the most important thing that anybody can do for all of us, because we're all fractured at this point. I, I guess you're right, too. I mean, I think if we really want to push back, we can think about sort of Gingrich and Clinton, but it really started to get bad uh, around Tea Party time, where, yeah. you know, people just, it wasn't just disagreement. Remember the guy at Congress getting up and screaming, you lie right. to Obama, and right. things got really, really nasty. Ugly, ugly. And, and I started to find it happening here, you know, within within my own congregation, and I didn't quite understand it. And I didn't understand as important my own role in it because we all do play a role. People said, I'm not, I said, you know what? We all live here. We're all responsible for what's going on. We elect all these people. Mm -hmm. And even if you didn't vote for the person you elected them. And, uh, and it's got to the point where, and I agree with you, where I used to love actually going to friends' homes yeah. where they believe differently. And we would, over a couple of drinks and a barbecue, have the best arguments in the world, but never were they mean and never were they... Uh, causing estrangement or anything like that. And then it started to happen where I stopped liking these conversations, where people around me started being scared of having the conversations, relationships were breaking as you described. And we started to take any issue, it could be the weather, not quite the weather, but almost. And we'd hold it up like it was a life or death issue or uh, one that we'd you know, break relationships over. Doctors started telling me that they had people coming in with what they call broken heart syndrome, where the, the world was making them so sad they had heart problems based on the current state of the world. And I was in an airport changing planes and feeling particularly down about this because it's my life. It's, you know, it's, it's and uh, someone sent me an article in that moment and it said something like, consider being part of the exhausted majority who is the radical center. I said, huh, what's this? This sounds like me. So basically the premise is that there are probably 65 or 70% of our country who actually do want to talk to each other, who do feel like they are willing to hear the other side and evolve, and that they're so tired that what they're doing is allowing in their silence, the fringes on each side to take over the microphone. And they end up driving you know, the red meat, the early primaries, the whole way that our system works. And I thought to myself, huh, there are politicians who want to be in the radical center, there are sociologists and other academics. There's no religious leaders. And that's when I wrote an article saying, I want to be the rabbi of the Radical Center. I wrote it for my professional uh, uh, publication. And most people, the critique was, oh, you're one of those, meaning centrist. And that was a euphemism for, for a wimp or wishy-washy. And I said, you know, I actually think it takes bravery to be here because you stand on your silo on the left or you stand on your silo on the right. And all you do is get your positions reaffirmed. There's nothing brave about that. Brave is actually saying my uh, devotion to centrism is as fervent as my devotion to my values. For me, they're left of center. But if I only live on the left of center, then I'm not living in the country. So I am trying to build a spirituality that undergirds a centrist position, not to be wishy-washy or compromise and everything, but where I'm willing to believe that I have something to learn from the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, see, that's what I really it's even it's carried certainly on to the college campuses where they don't want to listen, which we've discussed before. They don't want to listen to anybody else's point of view that isn't being sent out by the 
select professors who are, who are there teaching. Uh, and that's wrong also because formative age, when you're in your early 20s, uh, is really when you start thinking and you really should have both sides of an argument. I mean, we used to do that when we debated in high school. Uh, you had to listen to both sides and then make a decision where you wanted to go. Uh, I think we really have, both sides have points and we have to be open-minded enough to listen to it. So you're saying open-mindedness, like Rabbi, what are the ways you can like live, breathe, eat being in the radical center? Like how do you actually get see that through and get there? It means that unless a person is going to present a position that's existentially threatening, mm -hmm. meaning that violence is not okay. Right. Bringing down whole countries and systems, uh, you know, is not what this is about, uh, but it is about, uh, and it's also not about, preparing your your rebuttal while the person's still speaking it means mm -hmm. that i'm going to tell you what i think and with a full and open heart i want to hear what you think and then process it and then decide if there's anything in there that feels truthful to me affirm that back in return and have that so how does it break down let's take a real issue you know the, the hottest one during the trump years was immigration or at least that was the first one that was hot and I immediately took the position of, you know, uh, being compassionate and, you know, don't oppress a stranger because we were strangers in a strange land, the Passover story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my conservative congregants called me very angry. Why were you protesting at the airport? Are you going to politicize us? And instead of get mad, the first thing I would do is they, I pick up the phone and said, hello, Rabbi Dwarfs. Like, and I said, oh, hi, John, or whatever. That, and I said, how are you doing? I'm fine. Tell me about your wife and your kids. How are they doing? Oh, oh, they're, they're doing okay. How's Lauren and your kids? Immediately, you make it mm -hmm. relational. And, and then they would say, I'm really hurt because. And then one of them went on to say, I, I said, why are you so angry? And he said, well, I, don't, I never told you about my dad. My dad was killed by a terrorist in Egypt uh, at, at a corporate meeting. And I said, ah, okay. He has a lot of reason to be angry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we worked through the end and we got a phone and we said, could it be possible that you could want to be as compassionate to the strangers I'm asking you to be, and I'll be as devoted to security as you want to be? Mm -hmm. and we both said, ah, so you know what? You could, even if you want to build a wall, build a wall, and then let's decide that the people who come through, we're going to treat like mensches, like, like human beings. And why can't both of those things be true? So that's not an untenable or that only if human beings stay in their positions, does do they have to stay there. But on almost every issue, I think abortion may be the toughest. That, that, but even there, I think there's room to talk. But every other position, why couldn't you work it out? Unless you just hate people or want to win arguments. Yeah. I think you're so right in the ones that are a little bit more like social rights or like, you know, human rights that it's harder to have those conversations. Um, and I think you made a good point with strangers, like humanize yourselves and like have those relationships but then what if it's family what if it's a close friend you already know that like everything that's going on in their life and that they're good people how do you then talk calmly well and I think every I think talking calmly is really the way to go we have to listen to both sides we also have to follow certain basic laws um and our sure. lawmakers are not doing their job really because right. uh, they're really not and and you know uh, being I, since I read the papers every day and I'm sort of a student of history you know we never we have 11 million undocumented DACA work pe people living here now who still are waiting for Congress to pass proper immigration legislation. Forget the ones on the border, on the southern border. Those are coming in. We've got millions of them. We probably have loads of jobs for most of them that'll be fine. But we basic don't basically don't have an immigration policy that is correct for 2022 or 23. And I think that's the fault of who we're electing. And uh, if it was up to me, I would throw them all out. They'd be gone. And I would like to see a whole new slate of people in there who are going to do proper legislation for the people um, and for our future problems, which we have many. I mean, we there are a lot of things that are going to come up in the next 10 years that are going to be very important to legislate about. And uh, I don't think these people in Washington are doing us justice. And I'm a little disappointed. We've lost somewhat of the statesmen that I remember, uh, maybe I'm dreaming and maybe I'm glorifying them, but I do remember people were statesmen and we don't seem to have that very much anymore. They, Everyone is so mean to one another and belittle one another. By the end of the conversation, you don't, you know, you're almost scared to even say you like somebody. 
do you know there used to be a uh, unwritten rule that if you were visiting the state, if you were one senator visiting the state of another senator, you would eat at their home for dinner. And that ended about 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. And there was a writer who once said, the reason that was so effective is that if you sat down with someone's spouse and children, mm -hmm. it was very mm -hmm. hard for you to then get up and make a 30 second ad that was full right. of lies and, dis and, 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 and hurtful kinds of things. And, you know, and they say this about the Congress now, but they don't even, there's a Republican lunchroom, there's a Democratic mm -hmm. lunchroom. And, you know, I think Kim, when you asked before that, you know, my siblings and I have gone through some really rough times around political issues, but I have found that when it goes wrong fast, we let everything that's wrong about us come out. And when we act with our higher level self and know that the love that we have for each other supersedes these issues, uh, then we're able to talk about those issues in a different way. And they just assume, they assume that I feel A about Israel and I assume they feel B about Israel. And, but we don't really say it to each other, we just assume it. And once we mm -hmm. say it to each other lovingly, we're so much closer in position than we thought we were. Mm -hmm. What if you do say how you feel to each other? It's pretty drastically different than what do you have to have? Like, do you say, would you say avoid those conversations with those people maybe? Because it's just, you're not going to see eye to eye and like you want to maintain a relationship or like I have a friend who had a roommate. One was really left and one was really right like but they had to continue living together like is it better to just not discuss politics at all i don't i mean I, i'm that's not my way to I, because Me i neither. feel like all we're doing is we're 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 taking away elements of relationship right mm -hmm. and, and also elements of learning and elements of growth and evolution of self and i think that you, you know left and right doesn't mean that we have to say horrible things to each other right. and even if we believe things that are different you know, and, and I would say this, so if, if someone, if my right-wing roommate told me that immigrants are animals and they should be locked in cages and go to hell, I'd right. move out Yeah, because that's so dehumanizing. And if, I, and, and if my left-wing person said, you know, sorry, Israel, you know, Israel's an imperialist country and all they want to do is kill Arabs and, and, that, and it doesn't have the right to exist. But that's, those are red lines. But otherwise, yeah. right. if we start making certain things we just don't talk about, Mm -hmm. Then it's imagine being in a marriage like that, where you know, well, you know, all of us have reoccurring arguments. But if we decided never to have them, all we do is build up resentment and then right. not really be in relationship with them. Such a Correct. good point. That's a great point. Yeah, and I think a lot of the time also can these uh, arguments can kind of come from being misinformed because sometimes I feel like when you do have conversations with someone who's so different, you could both be saying things that you like heard that are just not even true. So then I think I don't know how to kind of get past that either when you're both saying conflicting information. It's like, do you sit down and like Google the truth? Like, but I also think you are, you're entitled to have different opinions. Just respect each other. But sometimes opinion, you think right, it's right? fact. Like sometimes well, I, I could be like, this is fact. And they could say this is fact. Well, that I don't know. I don't know what kind of facts are in this world. There are very few facts that we have to discuss. It's basically most of it is our is in our mind and our imagination. If we would sit down and have a conversation, have a cup of coffee together, you'd probably understand each other much better and not worry about the extremes. We're not going to invade Russia ourselves in our personal relationships. We really have to get along together on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's where I find it. I can bring it right down to where we go to a dinner party. I want to have friends. I don't want to have to worry that every time I say something, people are going to cringe or that they're going to say something. Right. You want to you wanna listen to their side. They have to listen to yours and then get on with dinner. I mean, it's enough. I, I, I agree. And I, and I worry that when we separate, we watch our own yeah. television stations, we watch our own, you know, read our own newspapers, and we end up just being told that what we believe is true when it's not. We all know that there are lots, you know, the small T truths and big T truths. If someone, you know, really just outright that this is a, a outright lies, and then I think, you know, you can say, hey, listen, here's this information, and, you know, right. that, that means, and there are certain people who are living when you send pictures of, you know, Hunter Biden raping five-year-olds, you know, it's a, it's a, I mean, Hunter Biden may or may not be a corrupt man. I don't know. I don't pay attention enough to know, but I, I don't think he's in the QAnon world of, of raping children, God forbid. Yeah. And so those kinds of things, we will sit at a dinner table and try to convince you of that. That probably means that that friendship can't be a friendship anymore because it's just too far-fetched and they're living in a different world, but that's different 
than you voting for Donald Trump and people breaking off relationship in right, 2016 sure, right. without asking, without even talking about it, you right. know, why and what. And so. I think I think there's extremes. And I and I think when people don't like you were saying in the book, tr each person thinks that what they are thinking is true. So what the best thing to do is sit down around a table and talk it through. And maybe you're right in one way and they are right in another way. And hopefully you can talk about it and have a dialogue that's constructive. And I would love to see what you're doing in your community. You're doing these small little focus groups. Yes. D discuss that a tiny yes. bit. It's called Resetting the Table. It's a Jewish organization that specifically goes to any Jewish community. Uh, you have to pay for it, but it's not expensive. Right. And they ask you to bring together Democrats, independents, and Republicans. And th to admit right. that this is where, and they're put into groups and they're taught how to talk to each other and how to listen to each other. They're given skills. They're never allowed to reveal their political affiliation. They're only asked to talk about the values that are being put forth. And it turns out when they talk about positions through the lens of values and not through the lens of which way they vote, that 85% of the time they come to agreement. Mm -hmm. And the big complaint that I get from those groups are, come on, you didn't really put me in a group with uh, people who are opposite me. They were all Democrats. So they were all Republicans. I said, no, every single group was. But when you, when you remove the purely political and you make it about the purely you know, societal you know, issues, values, People come together much more quickly. Now, in fairness, we're in New Jersey. It's the Northeast. Even if you're Republican and Democrat, you're probably much closer in voting than others are. But still, I, I bet you would work in the Midwest also. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. I think it's a great concept. I hope more communities adapt this because I think it's really a conversation in every place that we really need to be doing. A lot of times I've uh, done now, you know, something like the book just came out three and a half weeks ago. So I've done about 15 events so far. And sometimes people's faces look deflated. Like they, they seem like, you know, how is this ever going to get better? And it's not on its own. It's going to be better. And, and, and yet I do, I am hopeful. I'm optimistic. I, I, I really believe that each day we have the chance of making it better, but it's not going to happen by itself. Right. It's going to happen because people who are um, grown up, and I don't mean of age, I mean act in a way that it's grown up and with goodwill and with the idea that they're really not trying to spend their lives convincing others that they're wrong. They just want to be able to openly hear thoroughly be willing to evolve, be willing to even change what their sense of the world is, uh, that if we do this in a way that is goodwill and mature, that we really have a chance of breaking the cycle. And I believe the opposite is true. If we don't, I believe that our societal fabric will continue to fray. And I think the choice, I, I said this on TV a few weeks ago, the soul of America is up for grabs right now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we have a, uh, uh, we have a voice in what that is. It's, it's not just up for like, you know, the spirits to decide. It's up to us to decide. Maybe this is coming from an ignorant perspective, but like when I go to temple, I'm the youngest one there. I feel like everyone's kind of older or people get reinvolved when they get married and have kids again. But I feel like people kind of in their 20s and 30s, I don't know anyone personally who is very connected and like bringing their religion in on a daily basis. Um I don't know. I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that and maybe like how you get younger people involved. It's a, it's a great question. And, and you're speaking truth. And uh, there are, and, and the mistake that faith leaders might make is to think because they're not there, that they're not seeking meaning and purpose. And uh, as I joked from uh, with people as a mentor once pointed out to me, you can't take a vegetarian to eat a Peter Luger's. <laughs> um, but it's not because they're not hungry. It's because they don't have a menu from which to eat. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to figure out what a menu for the millennial or Gen Z is. Yeah. Because if we don't, we're gonna make we're gonna make the mistake of thinking that they're not searching. You are searching. I mean, to whatever degree, everyone is searching. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, how do we make that work? So what we're doing here is we're actually, you know, we're a suburban synagogue. So. You're probably not out here unless you're married uh, or married with kids. Yeah. So what we do is we actually uh, once a month have a gathering in the city um, in Manhattan. Uh, we, we combine with the synagogue, with the synagogue I used to work for when I was in the city. And we get 200 kids a month, kids. I don't need to call them kids your age, you know, anywhere from 23 to 40. Mm -hmm. And they come and they eat and they drink. And then we mix in some prayerful moments and some learning 
but we don't smack them in the face with it. We and, and it's also not a meat market. I'm not saying that people haven't met to get married there, but that's not the goal. We're not saying come here, you're gonna because you know what that's like. Also, then all you're doing is you know you're looking around, you feel like people are stalkerish. This, this is just a place for sushi and wine, right? And it's only an hour and a half. And we put in spiritual moments, again, prayerful and, and study wise. Mm -hmm. And then people, then they all go out together. People go out and, you know, then they finish it. They have a Friday night, but it started off with the Jewish connection. Right. And it's, it's always oversubscribed, it, unless it was COVID or it's horrible weather. So I do think people are looking, you just can't expect them to show up in the synagogue on a Friday night where everyone is 30 years older than they are. I agree yeah. with you. And it doesn't have to be through a synagogue either, right? Like anything. it could be a college, a, uh, going to your university clubs. It could be anything. But people need to get together and talk yeah. and or, speak their yeah. values and talk to each other and understand one another. You can't live. What is it? No man is an island. And that's really the case with everything. And so, um, Rabbi, I really really appreciate you today taking your valuable time uh your book is to build a brave space uh it's wonderful uh anybody who has it well everybody most people haven't read it because it's just been out three weeks it's the making of a spiritual first responder and i truly loved every single chapter it was really beautifully done and i enjoyed it and uh, i wish you all good luck in getting everybody together yeah and rabbi <laughs> let people know if there's a way they can follow you or the best way to get your book thank you so the the book every place that you can buy books amazon barnes and noble all those places you can get it and um it's funny i, I was never a rabbi who had a website but i do because of the book i so it's it's uh, rabbi matt, matt gewartz or rabbi matt.com and uh, there's all kinds of articles and media appearances and reviews of the book that you can find and of course twitter at rabbi matt and so, and instagram and all so it's very easy to find me in all those places and this is just, you know, I've done a lot of these so far. This is one of my favorite conversations. You. Again, you, you bring a, a Hamish a feeling to something that's really, and Thank these you. are important conversations, but they don't have to be arduous. They, they right. just have to be deep. And the both of you are really deep and wise. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And uh, follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Excuse my grandma. Rate our podcast five stars. Press follow on Spotify. And we'll see you next week.